Okay, here we are, continuing chapter three. By the middle of May, warm spring winds had scattered the last of the petals. The young leathery apple leaves had filled out and grown a glossy dark sheen on their upper surface, surfaces. The undersides were pale and velvety. The grasses, wild mustard, and assorted weeds beneath the trees had also grown tall and had to be cut. One May, mo one May Monday morning, uh, Ken Castro, Anton's younger brother, instructed Stephen on the cutter bar. Sometimes you hit a rock and break off teeth, or sometimes you hit something that just don't give, and something breaks. It's designed so that if you hit something big, it'll snap loose, so nothing, so it doesn't break. But sometimes parts break anyway, and you have to fix them. Either way, you're going to have to learn to weld, he said. Ken took Stephen into the shop, uh, into the shop room of the main garage building. Stephen saw interesting tools, grinding wheels, acetylene torches, and uh, machines for fixing and making things. Ken Castro wheeled out the big blue metal box that was the welding machine. He pointed to a coat, uh, he pointed to a coat rack on which hung several brown leather welding smocks, uh, and uh, 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 on which several brown leather welding smocks hung and told Stephen to put one on uh, one of the put, to put on one of those and a pair of thick leather welding gloves ken arranged pieces of scrap angle iron on the shop floor and showed Stephen how to fit the welding rod into the handle and how to dial in the right power and to clamp the grounding cable onto the piece you are going to weld he picked up a welding mask and showed it to Stephen the lenses were so dark that Stephen couldn't see through them at all. Ken fitted the headband on Stephen's head and adjusted it tight. He showed Stephen how to raise and lower the mask. He took a mask for himself, put it on, and knelt down before the steel on the floor. Stephen watched as Ken held his mask up with his left hand and brought the tip of the welding rod down close to the seam uh, he was going to weld, about half an inch away from the metal. Then he told Stephen to lower his mask, as he himself did too. Behind the mask, it was totally dark, as if the lenses were opaque. Then Ken touched the rod tip to the metal, and suddenly there was light. Stephen watched Ken, all lit up green, as if through night vision goggles. Ken moved the welding rod in tiny circles, working his way down the seam. After welding a few inches, he pulled the rod away and darkness returned. They lifted their masks and looked at the work. Ken pointed out the black crust on the seam. That was slag, he said. He tapped the work with a small hammer and the slag fell off in chips. Underneath the slag was bright, shiny metal a beautiful welded seam uh, with tiny, even ridges. Ken explained that there are a few common problems that can happen while welding. Sometimes the stick gets stuck if you try to move it too fast. If that happens, he said, just pull back and the rod will come out of the handle. You'll have a, you'll have a welding rod sticking out of your piece, which doesn't look nice, but you can just grind it off with a disc grinder. Uh, which he pointed out on the workbench. Uh, he pointed to on the workbench. He continued, "If the power is too low, it'll happen more often. If the power is too high and the metal too thin, you might melt a hole in the piece." He said the best way to learn was just to do it for a couple hours until you get the hang of it. So he put a fresh rod in the handle and showed Stephen how to turn the machine on and off and gave him a cylindrical box full of welding rods and the handle uh, at the end of the thick cable. He told Stephen to go ahead and try it. So Stephen got everything ready uh, and held the stick close to the work. He pulled down his mask, as Ken had done, and touched the rod to the metal. He was surprised to find that it was working okay for the first inch or so. 
Then he noticed that he must be going too slow because it looked like a pool of molten metal was growing around the rod tip, glowing green through the lenses. So he went a little faster. But then exactly what Ken had said could happen did happen. Uh, 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 the rod got stuck in one spot. He couldn't move it, and it looked like the molten pool was getting bigger. So he did what Ken had, uh, Ken had said to do and pulled back. The light stopped, and he lifted his mask to look at what he'd done. Just like Ken said, the butt of the welding rod was sticking out of the piece. Ken smiled, looked at Stephen's weld, tapped away the slag, and pointed out that the first inch was pretty good. But after that, it looks like you got nervous and changed your pace, Ken said. Don't worry, it's not easy to weld. You just practice on these pieces until lunch, he told Stephen. Then Ken left. Stephen knelt on the floor of the, you know, knelt on the floor of the shop with the scraps of angle iron and other pieces of steel. He'd just been told by Ken Castro that his task until lunchtime was to learn how to weld by himself. He felt good that he was, re he was really learning a valuable skill. Okay, so here's a picture of that. That's, there's the welding machine and there's Stephen there and have all the, that's the uh, shop room there. Okay. Stephen ground off the stub of, of rod sticking out of the well, of his weld. He put in, uh, yeah, put a fresh rod in the handle, brought it to the seam, pulled down the mask, and started again. He tried making the circles wider to see what that would do. He pulled the rod away, unstuck, lifted the mask to inspect his work. He saw that his strokes were irregular and ungraceful. He tried again, going slower and going faster, making the circles tighter or wider. After a while, he could, uh, he could make what he thought were uh, pretty good welds. As the morning progressed, he felt like he was getting the hang of it. He could reliably make two pieces of metal hold together. He used the disc grinder to smooth out the, the stumps of rods that had gotten stuck, and he experimented with higher and lower power. He got to a point where he could avoid getting the rod stuck. Of all his friends, Stephen thought to himself, he was the only one who, uh, who knew how to weld. He looked at the clock and saw that it was almost 9.30. Time for coffee break, down, you know, time for coffee break down at the packing house. He shut off the machine, set the equipment down neatly, and walked through the building to the break room to, in the packing house. All the ladies were there, as well as Ted Castro and Burl Crothers. Stephen had seen Burl, but never talked to him. Burl had thick glasses and oily dark hair combed over his balding head. Stephen guessed he was in his fifties. Uh, uh, Stephen said hello to him, but Burl did not reply. Stephen mostly talked to Doreen. So, Kenny says you're learning how to weld, Doreen said. Yep, never, never welded before, but he showed me how, so I'm practicing until lunch. I guess I'll be doing cutter bar after that, he, Stephen said. I see. Yes, cutter bars are always breaking down. <laughs> Welding. Ha, she laughed. Sounds fun. She leaned back, relaxing into a long drag on her cigarette. Stephen wasn't sure if maybe she was being sarcastic. Stephen often had that feeling, the feeling that he was not getting a joke. It sometimes worried him, but long ago he had resolved just to try to figure out, uh, figure if, if what people said made sense, and not to worry if there was sarcasm he wasn't catching. Stephen liked Doreen. She was a lot like his mother, he thought. Mrs. Stroh also smoked and had similar mannerisms. She and Doreen both settled into their chairs the same way, looking at Stephen, smiling, exhaling smoke through their nostrils. After coffee break, Stephen returned to welding. Ken Castro arrived at the shop uh, about, uh, about a half hour before lunch. He inspected Stephen's welds. He pointed out a few messy spots, but said that for the most part, they were okay. Stephen and Ken put away the welding equipment, 
and Ken told Stephen to go start up the 2000 and bring it to the shop. They were going to fit the cutter, uh, the cutter bar onto the tractor. Stephen did his tractor routine, but without the coffee, and drove up to the shop. He backed up uh, to the cutter bar, which rested on a stack of pallets on the edge of the garage. Ken hitched it up. There's just one thing you're going to have to do all the time with the cutter bar, and that's replace the teeth on it, Ken said. He showed Stephen how to remove the spring steel slats that, uh, onto which the, the teeth were mounted. It was, uh, it was surprisingly simple, Stephen noticed. Ken just opened the, a hasp and lifted the slat holding the teeth off its runner, and that was all. There happened to be a chipped tooth already on it. Perfect for Ken to demonstrate on it. On. They took the slat outside to the edge of the pavement and set it on a rack, uh, set it on a rock that would serve as an anvil. Ken Castro took a steel peg from his pocket. This is a cold chisel, he said. Uh, we hold this tight up, uh, tight up against the slat, and then usually with one good whack, you can knock the head off the rivet. Ken explained as he worked. Uh, as he talked, uh, one tap of the ball-peen hammer sent the little rivet head flying off into the grass. Here, you do this one, Ken said to Stephen, handing him the hammer and chisel. Stephen knelt down, placed the chisel, and tapped. He succeeded in denting the rivet head, but it took him four or five taps to cut off the head. You'll get the hang of it. Fact is, it don't matter how many taps it takes to knock off the head, just matters that the head gets knocked off. Ken took another tool from his pocket. This was a rivet punch. Stephen had never seen one before. Each tooth was held in place by two rivets. Ken used the punch and hammer to tap out the two headless rivets, and the tooth came loose. It didn't look difficult. There was a box of extra teeth and rivets inside the tractor's toolbox. Ken took out a tooth, two fresh rivets, and a set of uh, and a set uh, and set a different rivet tool under the hole where the rivet would protrude. He put a rivet in the hole in the tooth and threw the hole in the slat and tapped it into place with the hammer, holding the bottom punch under the rivet. The shape of the top rivet punch mushroomed the top, securing the tooth, and it was done. Replacing teeth was much easier than welding, Stephen thought. That day, after lunch, Stephen was sent out to mow the blocks around the packing house. When he hit a big rock, the whole arm indeed became unhi unhitched and swung back and dragged behind the tractor. Stephen recognized that the machine was designed that way, to accommodate mistakes. Stephen put the tractor in neutral, set the brake, jumped off, pulled the cutter bar back into place, and noticed the pleasing click, and hopped back on the tractor and continued work. At 2.30, Stephen stopped for a break. It was too far to go back to the packing house, so he found a corner of the block where the land on the other side of the stone wall dropped away affording a beautiful view. Stephen could see the steeple of the church and to the right of that, the new Dartford Town Hall. He poured the last of the coffee from his thermos into the lid cup, put his, coffee, uh, put his feet up on one fender and leaned back against the other fender, sitting crosswise on the, street, on the seat. He was comfortable. He reflected on his day. In the morning, he'd been taught how to weld and rivet. In the afternoon, he'd been set loose with the cutter bar. He learned to keep his hand on the lift lever to lift the cutter bar over rocks. If there was a big rock, he could drive up to it without lifting the lever, but ju just stop short of the rock, then raise the lever and back off at an angle and approach it from a different angle, lowering the level a lever as he got into the unmowed parts. He could repeat that a few time, a few, at a few different angles until the area was mowed. For smaller rocks, he could lift the lever and the cutter bar would rise up and he could drive forward over the rock. 
lower the level lever again and continue mowing, following the contour of the land. Stephen loved it. It was a sport. After break, he spent the afternoon trying to master his new craft. Sometimes he could really feel that he was uh, that he knew how to operate the 2000. He was getting good at shifting the tractor. Most of the mowing was done in first gear, but on stretches where it was only grass and soft weeds, he could put it in second. He found it was possible to shift without using the clutch by synchronizing the engine speed with the pace of the tractor, and the shifter would pop into place nicely. He felt like he was learning quickly. He was mowing down the weeds in the orchard on a big machine. There were two tractors fitted out with cutter bars, the Ford 2000 and the Ford 601. The other workers all said that the 2000 was a lousy tractor, that the 601 was much better. Stephen had, dri had tried driving the 601 on a few occasions. It was certainly a nice tractor. It was smaller and easier to drive than the 2000, uh, and they had all said that with a cutter bar it was more maneuverable than the lumbering 2000. Stephen didn't really care about that. The 2000 was perfectly adequate for the job of doing cutter bar, he thought. In, ta in contemplating this, Stephen thought of the legend of the Spitfire in the Battle of Britain in World War II. His father had once explained that the Spitfire had indeed performed with distinction, without a doubt, in the Battle of Britain. But he'd said that the majority of German planes had actually been downed by the less glamorous and more numerous Hawker Hurricane. In that month's long campaign, <laughs> Stephen remembered the particular choice of words his father had used when explaining history. He'd said that many pilots had actually preferred the Hurricane to the Spitfire, that the Spitfire became the legend that it did was largely due to the nature of the legend-making process and less to the qualities of the airplane itself. Stephen was happy to do cutter bar on the 2000. It wasn't long before Stephen had to replace cutter bar teeth in the field. The machine works okay with one or two teeth broken, but with more than that, the stems of tougher weeds get caught in the gaps they get pulled out of the ground, ripping up the orchard and clogging the machine. When Stephen had to change teeth for the first time, he drove to a rock, stopped the tractor, unhitched the hasp, and removed the top strip of teeth. He saw that he actually needed to replace three teeth. He noticed that all of the damaged teeth had been had broken off cleanly, without bending or uh, without bending the remaining part of the tooth. Then he realized that the teeth needed to hold an edge, so they must be made of hardened steel. Hardened steel is brittle. He knew that from talking with John Coleman, the owner of the bicycle shop. In this case, the brittleness of the steel is, is an advantage because when a tooth breaks, the remaining part of the tooth is not bent and can still slide smoothly against the facing set of teeth. So the machine is designed to still be operable with broken teeth. Stephen appreci appreciated the genius of that. He took a strip of teeth over to the rock and laid it down as Ken had. He went to the toolbox for the hammer and punches, new rivets, and three teeth. It was not difficult to remove the damaged teeth. Putting rivets in the new teeth, however, took skill. He put in a rivet, set the small piece that would act as an anvil under, underneath and placed the punch over the rivet and tapped with a hammer uh, with the hammer until the rivet was mushroomed down securing the tooth he was able to get the touch of it quickly and within about 15 minutes he had gotten all three teeth replaced he checked the bottom slat there were no broken teeth on it so So he put it all back together, closed the hasp, locked it with the clevis pin, and got back to work. It was during these first few weeks of operating the cutter bar that Stephen learned all of the different blocks of the orchard that Rock Mount Orchards managed. There were 15 blocks. Stephen had learned from Anton 
how the distant blocks had come out under the management of Rock Mount Orchards. Uh, uh, originally, they had been independent family farms, but as the economy had changed, the children of the orchardists did not want to stay at home and run the or to run the orchards. They left for higher paying jobs in Nashua or Manchester. Land prices had risen. Many owners had sold their land to developers and made enough money to retire in Florida. The developers had made contracts allowing for Woodmont Orchards to manage the orchards, the developers getting a cut of the money from selling the apples. This could continue until the developers, developers subdivided the land, uh, subdivided the blocks and built houses on them, which might take several years. Stephen studied the topographical maps in the office to learn all the back roads to get to the far-flung blocks. He'd grown up in the area, but now he was learning roads he'd never known. Some of them were dirt roads, hardly more than hiking trails, rarely used, but for the very orchard machines he drove. Those, tr uh, those tracks went through beautiful land. Indeed, some of those roads were used as snowmobile, snowmobile trails in the winter. Stephen's favorite was the series of dirt tracks it took to get to a block called the Young by the back way. The Young was what they called a group of several orchard blocks not far away from I mean, not far from Highway 101, several miles west of New Dartford in the chap a town of Chapel. The little roads went through the woods with no houses for miles. At one point, the path crossed a swamp on a narrow causeway with a culvert in the middle draining the water from one side, but there was no perceptible current around the culvert. Even so, the water did not look stagnant it was tea-colored, but clear. A great forest of white oak covered the hills in this watershed. Stephen surmised that the tea-color was tannin leached from the fa their fallen leaves. The first time Stephen drove the 2000 along that causeway, he saw a great blue heron disappearing in the distance, flying languidly, as if in slow motion. Beside the path, there were tufts of goldenrod and sweet fern on the sandy parts, and uh, so in the shallow water at the edge, wide swaths of cattail and sweet flag swayed in the breeze. Tufts of purple iris just starting to bloom jutted out of the water like gray-green swords. Further out, there was arrowhead, pickerel weed, and white and yellow water lilies. It was all very interesting to Stephen. He'd read that most of those, these plants were edible. In the field guide to edible wild plants, he'd read that in the old days, sweet flag had been soaked in sugar to preserve it and was sold as candy. He loved the way sweet flag looks, bright green reeds growing out of the shallow water, sword-like, with about two feet tall with a little flower spike that juts out of the side of the reed about six inches from the top. It smells sort of like ginger. Arrowhead, pickerel weed, and water lily all have edible tubers. Cattail roots are full of starch and were used by the Indians as food. Stephen knew that every part of that plant is edible. He also knew that Green pine needles were so rich in vitamin C that if every day you chewed a little as one would chew tobacco, you'd never have to worry about scurvy. These were the thoughts that passed through Stephen's mind as he and his tractor, the Ford 2000, rumbled along, they rumbled along the causeway across the swamp. He continued his reverie. He'd read that... As mighty as the British Navy had been in the age of sail, that it had been qu it had been quite late actually in the nineteenth century that they had learned that it was vitamin C that prevented scurvy, and that even after they had learned that citrus fruits contained the answer to the problem that had vexed them for centuries, he said, imitated him, imitating his father, uh, they may they had made the mistake of boiling the juice, thinking they were erring on the side of caution but thus destroying the life-saving properties of the juice. 
Stephen muttered to himself as he drove, Just to think, they used military power and killed all kinds of people to force access to land on which to grow a tropical fruit when all they had to do was bring a bunch of pine needles and uh, pine needles with them and chew them raw. Sometimes the answer to serious problems is right there if you know about it. But people usually don't know. That led to another thing Stephen had read in one of his father's books. In the early days of European colonialism, as Europeans ventured into, the tro into tropical countries, malaria was primary among a host of other diseases. The Spanish conquistadors had learned about quinine, in the 1500s. When they became a maritime power, the Dutch had started great planting, plantations of chinchona trees, the source of quinine, in their colony, the Dutch East Indies, which Stephen knew was now called Indonesia. Stephen had read that during the Second World War, both the Japanese and Americans had experienced, criti experienced critical shortages of quinine in the Pacific Island campaign, and thousands of people died from malaria on both sides because of this. But he read that the Japanese had occupied the plantations in Java and Borneo that on the eve of the war had produced over 90% of the world's quinine. Yet Japanese soldiers in the Pacific su suffered terribly from malaria. Stephen didn't know how or why they would have not been able to make use of the Chinchona plantations they had. Surely they must have known about them. But soon Stephen arrived at the young and had to bring himself to the present, had to cut the weeds with the cutter bar. Okay, that's the end of chapter three.